So it's our pleasure and honor uh, to have her as our fourth speaker today. I mean, it's it's an enriching day and uh, we're scaling up. So thanks very much for being part of this. Uh, Luneke is uh, from the Netherlands originally. He has a, she has a background in uh, technical mathematics, <laughs> so close to our, our background from TU Delft. And since 2017, she is the COO, Chief Operating Officer of the Ocean Cleanup, a uh, startup of which we will hear definitely more about and learn more about. The format will be a fine side chat. So uh, uh, Angela um, and Loneke will kind of have a conversation on the, on relevant topics. And uh, yeah, we're really excited to hear from you, Loneke. And uh, yeah, looking forward. Thank you very much. Before we start, Loneke wants me to play a video so that you actually can see uh, what it is about. There is bad news for our ocean. A patch of floating trash and plastic in the Pacific Ocean is getting worse by the day. The problem is even worse than originally thought. To quantify a problem of this size, we had to do research at a scale that had never been done before. To truly rid the oceans of plastic, what we need to do is two things. One, we need to clean up the legacy pollution. Today, we'll be launching the world's first ocean cleanup system heading towards the Great Pacific Garbage Bay. So there you have it. We've just passed the Golden Gate Bridge, the iconic moment. It's absolutely incredible. Every hour is a small victory and every plastic bee that you all catch is a small victory. We now have a system that's catching plastic. Two, we need to close the tap. The world's first scalable river plastic solution. Right now, interceptor one is cleaning in Indonesia. Interceptor two is cleaning in Malaysia. Imagine if we do get this done, we could truly make our oceans clean again. Okay, great. So, Lonica, so really great to have you uh, today with us. You're actually overlooking the actual execution from idea to de deployment uh, and all the operations around it, like a massive operation to clean all the oceans, uh, well, 90% uh, of the plastic out of the ocean, as I understood. Uh, and oh, by the way, everyone in the room, if you have questions, please start asking them in the chat. One of the things that when people hear about ocean cleanup, what I hear um, every now and then is like, yeah, but, you know, you can cl cleaning means that you can keep polluting. What do you? What is uh, your um, view on that? Yeah, thank you, Angela, and thank you for having me in this uh, interesting <laughs> symposium. Very novel format, uh, excellent. Um, what we're trying to do is, of course, uh, solve a massive environmental uh, pollution problem within the ocean cleanup. Um, we're trying to do that from an approach to um, put ourselves out of business pretty quickly. We're a non-profit organization and we consider ourselves to be a project. We've developed a strategy to uh, prevent the pollution by both cleaning up what's already in the ocean and really working hard at preventing uh, more plastic to enter the ocean in the first place. Um, of course, uh, we don't want to do this forever. It shouldn't be necessary forever. So at some point, things need to change in our society, in the environment, uh, so that uh, we don't continue to contribute to, to polluting uh, our oceans. Um, I think uh, it, it's um, debatable whether people will continue to be, uh, pollute if you actually show efforts to, uh, to clean it. Uh, because it, first of all, it, it raises awareness that it's actually a bad thing that you're not uh, cleaning up after yourself um, nicely. On the other side, on the other hand, uh, in the, um, the, the main contributing uh, rivers that, that pollute the ocean the most, that's actually the, the problems behind that pollution are far more complicated than psychology. And people dumping things in the in the river because they can. Um, the, the, the factors that play 
uh, a role there, of course, are the complete lack of uh, proper uh, waste infrastructure, the excessive amounts of packaging that is uh, uh, used in, uh, in emerging economies, etc. So it's a complex problem and we want to contribute by uh, cleaning it, but also we want to be complete or end at some point with cleaning. So we've set ourselves quite some quantitative um, deadlines and, and, and production uh, um, targets. Uh, we want to put ourselves out of business by the year 2040. Um, and by that time, other things need to have happened. The application of plastic needs to have changed. Uh, different types of materials should be used. Proper waste infrastructure and recycling uh, incentives need to be in place, etc. Thanks, because some people also say like technology is blamed for the environmental problems, right? So there's all the things that we can now mass produce and we can, you know, because of that, actually, it is part of the problem. So how do you see that? And that's, of course, also true. Uh, technology caused a lot of the, the damage to our uh, environment, to our planet. Uh, mind you, the invention of plastic itself made a lot of things possible and highly improved uh, our hygiene and, and health and, and the, the way that the products are longer, uh, yeah, they're, they're less perishable, etc. So it has helped a lot. However, uh, there's so much of it and there's so little infrastructure or incentive to actually use the materials because it's so cheap to produce new, what we call virgin plastic, so fresh from oil produced. Um, the, yeah, there's hardly any incentive to uh, collect uh, used plastic and, and recycle it because making new, new plastic is much cheaper. Um, however, technology can cause damage to the environment, but what our organization is trying to prove is that technology can also improve the environment and can help uh, overcome certain problems and, and, and introduce solutions. So that's why um, we apply technology. We really are a tech-oriented uh, organization. So um, we're trying to de develop, invent, develop and deploy technical solutions to an environmental problem um, to show that you can use technology in uh, a proper way um, and it's not the enemy. We don't have to abandon technology to save our planet. Thank you. So all, of course, everyone here in the call, the background is engineering, and everyone is wondering, like, what can we do uh, to solve the problem? Boyan, who, guys, everyone saw him in the video, he's the guy from TU Delft. He was, I don't know, 16 or 18 when he started this whole thing and made it a crazy idea and bring it in reality. So here there's a lot of people on the call who also might have great ideas, big ideas, or small and big ideas. But to bring this into reality was uh, not easy, I suppose. So what tips could you give people here on a call to, if they have an idea based on technology or research that they're doing, how they can actually make a difference? Yeah, Boyan's idea uh, came with him when he was really uh, young and he produced this uh, YouTube video of it. Uh, and uh, as a result of that, he was invited to do a TEDx talk. In, in fact, uh, um, with current technology, uh, the, the, the current status of uh, internet and, and, and how things go in, in a global uh, communication scale, uh, that really helped him to present his idea and to uh, get a lot of attention. Uh, and um, at the end, or at some point, he even managed to get uh, funding ready so that he could try uh, and, and execute it. So the, the modern uh, media certainly helped uh, his idea uh, and, and yeah I think it's uh, it's very good if you have a, a, an idea um, to, to share it um, through all sorts of means that could help you get in touch with the people that can either support you advise you or fund you uh, so that that is for sure uh, a good idea to, to think about who would be interested in, in this idea and how do I get to this people rather than only having set, setting up an appointment with a bank. I mean, that's probably not that effective. I'm just thinking about also people like Greta Thunberg, of course, that everyone is thinking of. So it's really about getting 
understanding also how to communicate it, right? How to communicate and how to, to reach the masses. Sure, he, uh, he's, uh, Boyan has proven himself to be very intuitive, and very smart about how to communicate his idea and how to uh, render the best possible outcome from sharing his thought. What's the, the main challenge for, for the ocean cleanup? In, because you're COO, so operationally, what's the major challenge of this sort? Because you have, of course, had a long track record in the maritime business already, like uh, for, I don't know, 15 or 20 years, that you're working on like these construction and in maritime projects. So what is the yeah, main challenge of a project like the ocean cleanup? Yeah, that's uh, also a very good question. Actually, we have so many challenges. I mean, the challenge today is, of course, the fact that all of our entire team is all working from home, which could be around the world. Um, so very international team. Um, and, and some of our operations are certainly uh, being delayed because of this uh, current situation. But that's temporary and we need to solve this pollution uh, problem so we will persevere um, the challenges in the ocean uh, project uh, so developing the technology for the ocean project are quite distinct from the challenges that we have in the river project with our interceptors in the ocean it's really challenging to get the technology right uh, the the way that plastic behaves in the ocean and the way any sort of uh, structure that you place there uh, in relation to this plastic um, has proven to be a very, very complex uh, problem. Um, so the challenge there is to really tweak the technology until we get it right without uh, spending um, too much uh, both uh, expenses as well as carbon emissions. Of course, we need to go out there with a, with a vessel each time. Uh, so it needs to be very effective, the test that we do. So at this stage, we're still intermittent between going offshore with uh, with systems to, to collect information and, and test things uh, versus uh, sitting behind our computers or in uh, laboratories or in um, other facilities, swimming pools or whatever, where we test some of our ideas uh, and, and getting that, that challenge right so that we uh, get to the right technology in the, in the best possible way. That's, that's for sure a massive challenge. And working out in the Great Pacific Garbage Patch, which, which is this gyre offshore of the United States, is a challenge in itself because it's so far away. It, and it's a massive uh, area and it's really, really isolated. So getting there will, I mean, yeah, it will take you a week of sailing before you enter that region. So you can uh, appreciate that it, it's, it is remote work and it takes considerable preparation. Uh, it's not something you, uh, you do lightly. Um, on the river project, the challenge is in the sheer volume of, of what we're trying to do. We are um, scientists have calculated that to reduce the plastic influx uh, with 80% of its current level, we need to address a thousand rivers. And we want to achieve that in a relatively short time period. We've given ourselves five years to uh, be present in a thousand rivers with some sort of cleanup system. Um, the technology of the interceptor is of course still evolving, but that's quite mature and that has proven to be working. Um, or it can always be optimized. However, the, the size of the challenge here is, is so massive because those thousand rivers are in, of course, a multitude of, of countries and every, each country has its own um, yeah, governmental structure, who is in charge of placing things in a river and how do you set up uh, an, an operating model where there's, yeah, everyday people collecting the, the, the plastic and debris that you collect in an interceptor and taking it to a proper waste facility, etc. So that's, that is the challenge. It's the sheer size and number of projects that you need to develop in one go. So what we need to do there is actually collaborate with preferably global or otherwise regional partners so that we can go faster. We can't do that all by ourselves because we are still a relatively small organization. And I think that we want to stay a relatively small organization to maintain our core strength. There's a lot of questions in the chat. So Martin was the first one with the question. So Martin, please. Yeah, so I saw besides the big ocean cleanup thingy, you also have the interceptors, which are now cleaning rivers, which will probably have a huge impact. 
but it's kind of sad to see that so far only four of these have been implemented and you were planning to implement them in like 100 rivers. So how can we support you with that? Yeah, no, our, our ambition is actually a thousand rivers. So uh, <laughs> we, we still have a way to go. Um, and uh, the, the challenge, is, uh, as I explained there, is to, how, is to set up a structure uh, of alliances or consortia that will take us there a lot quicker. Um, a lot of countries where we would like to have an interceptor, of course, lack waste infrastructure. Um, and that means that if we collect the waste, if, if our interceptor assists in, in taking the waste out of the water, uh, and then we want to, it to be treated responsibly. Uh, there, there's quite a few steps that we need to take. Um, yeah, how uh, uh, the, the placement, the financing of an interceptor is actually uh, um, relatively, yeah, nothing is cheap in this world, but it, it does make sense to place one compared to the cost that you have uh, for not cleaning the rivers. Uh, Deloitte has assisted us in a study that uh, uh, it's called the, the price stack of plastic pollution that actually calculates quite detailed what it costs what it's costing to a, a uh, community to not clean your rivers and then placing one is is makes sense it will save you money in the in the in the, in the long run uh, but for now we're still providing uh, financing for for some of these uh, river cleaning projects. So uh, if your question is really concrete, what can you do to help? Uh, that's for sure. Always to um, uh, share our message on social media everywhere. Uh, if you uh, are very uh, interested, you can start uh, assisting fundraising or in whatever company you are working or uh, uh, your network of companies, maybe see if there is a way to collaborate in, in this in, in an alliance or in a consortium from that company perspective so that we can have a global impact a bit quicker. Okay, thank you very much. I'll shout the idea of maybe uh, adding some sensors to your systems then. Uh, sensors? And yeah, there, there is quite a few sensors on the system, but uh, <laughs> which sensors would you like to add? I mean, you could also use this to monitor river health and so on and put this on a global map. And I mean, we're a small company, but maybe we can assist with oh, yeah. some IoT-like products to add. Oh, sure, yeah, yeah. We, we, we do have the opportunity to actually measure quite a few parameters from these uh, systems. So, uh, and, and we are installing uh, river monitoring systems on bridges as well, uh, which are delivering a lot of data that we use, but I'm sure that other uh, organizations have good use for that data too. And as we are a nonprofit, we certainly are very transparent uh, and, and share uh, our uh, information very much open source. Thanks, Lonica. Thank you, Martin, as well. So uh, another question comes from Davika. Davika, are you there? Yeah. Uh, hi, Lonica. Uh, I just wanted to know, uh, even if we do have the incentive to recycle the plastics that's collected from the oceans, how much of it can actually be recycled? Uh, what will happen to the ones that the bits that are not recycled uh, and so on? Yeah, so what we're doing is we are collecting the material from the ocean, which is really, really shitty plastic. It's been out in the ocean sometimes for decades. It's been degraded. Uh, there's all sorts of um, bioorganisms growing in and on it. There's, well, there's a lot going on, which makes it, yeah, normally it's not usable at all. Um, however, because we are really, uh, there's a few aspects to uh, our uh, intent to still use this material. And the, the, the most important one is that we really want to prove that with technology, again, with focus and, and, and attention and uh, persistence, uh, it is possible to um, reuse plastic, um, however bad it is. And, and that's what we have committed to. So we want to use technologies to show that even the worst plastic uh, that you could you, that you could find is recyclable uh, from the proceeds of those recycle activities. We we will of course continue to fund our operations, um, but the main message is that if this plastic, which is horrible, can uh, be recycled, 
then you should be able to immediately recycle household plastic. That should be far easier. Uh, and still, it's not happening on a global scale because it's cheaper to make new plastic. So we really need to, uh, as a yeah, as humankind, focus on what what to do with uh, used plastic. All right. Thank you so much, uh, Loneke. We generally hear that let's say the ocean pollution is the fault or to a certain extent is the fault of developing country. Is that actually true? Do you have information on that or is it just us developed economy shifting the problem somewhere else? Well, we are doing quite a lot of research where the plastic uh, uh, goes when it enters the ocean, where does it come from, what are the main contributors and what happens to it. Um, we, we're doing research there, but not to place blame, but to actually uh, be able to intervene and, and prevent it from happening in the future. The materials that we are finding in the Great Pacific Garbage Patch is quite often plastic that has been traveling to that specific area for many years, decades sometimes, so we find really old plastic. Um, and that is, yeah, it can be used by, by everybody. Um, it is true that the rivers uh, contribute quite a lot to the, uh, the feeding of this, uh, these gyres, these garbage patches. Uh, and the most polluting rivers, as I said, a thousand rivers pollute for about 80% of the overall uh, problem that's the influx. And those rivers are mostly located in the tropical sphere, so around the equator, um, where there's a lot of rain, of course, and uh, also quite often uh, countries who lack a bit of uh, wa proper waste infrastructure. Um, so it, that we do see, uh, but the things that we find in the Great Pacific Garbage Patch, for instance, also consist a lot of uh, maritime sources. So there's a lot of uh, plastic there that originates from agriculture, fish farms, if you like, um, a lot of uh, fish nets uh, that are floating around. Um, so it's, it's not just uh, emerging economies that are uh, polluting. And of course, we also found a lot of debris, for instance, from the tsunami uh, that, that occurred. So that also could end up in a, in a garbage patch at some point. Okay, thank you. Thank, thank you. Let's take another um, two questions. Andreas, are you there? Yes. Hi, Danica. Um, I'd be interested in how your organization is financed. Yeah. We are non, a non-profit organization, so everything that we, uh, 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 yeah, all of our funds are donations. Um, we have been lucky to receive a lot of small donations from uh, people fundraising on Facebook, etc. Uh, and that has really, really helped. We've done some crowdfunding in the past, but uh, nothing recently. And there's a, a, a contributing factor of uh, larger philanthropists, so benefactors, people uh, making larger donations uh, because they, they really care about the ocean and they want to uh, yeah, have this, uh, leave, their, <laughs> leave it as their legacy, so to say. Uh, and we are working with a lot of organizations and companies that either provides uh, things pro bono or really, really for, for a highly reduced prices. So in that way, we are sponsored by uh, uh, corporations. Um, yeah, and we're talking with uh, other uh, companies, maybe uh, for other forms of collaboration for the future. But for now, everything that we, um, that we have, so that we operate our, our um, organization with, our activities with, is uh, uh, by donation. Awesome, thanks. Thank you. Um, I think there's a few more in, yeah, interesting questions uh, in that sense. Um, so Eleanor, Eleanor, are you there? Um, yeah, so I, I wanted to know if you guys are working with any other organizations to try and stop the flow of plastic from, from further up the supply chain. Uh, at the moment I'm living in Brazil and I see a lot of plastic usage so you can see that the mindset is not really there among the people, but are you working with organizations to try to limit the amount of plastic in, in circulation? 
Um, we, we really made it our mission to uh, prevent, to, to do prevention by technology. Um, so we are uh, uh, working on our technology to clean up the ocean and to prevent uh, rivers from further polluting the ocean. Uh, where we can, we will influence uh, whatever policy makers or other organization uh, uh, yeah, uh, can help. But we know that we are not the organization that's really good at either education or uh, um, uh, lobbying or something like that. So we're part of our success, we believe, is that we really understand what we can do and what we're not good at. So. Uh, we focus on what we can do, and by doing that successfully, we raise awareness anyway. Uh, the, the, the problem will be more in the public eye if we, uh, if we are successful. Um, we will support where we can, but it's not part of our mission to actually uh, try and, and, and work further uh, in that uh, domain. Thank you. Thank you. Um, okay, so let's do Claudia's question. Yeah, uh, mine was very similar to the one from Eleanor, maybe uh, a little bit more general and broad. So if you partner up already with other star startups in your same arena or downstream or upstream, so for instance, we had a webinar some time ago with a startup, uh, what was the name, um, Plastic Pirate and Sailor. So they also tried to clean up <laughs> some okay. other oceans. Um, and um, as well, so not only startups, but also with other corporations or governmental bodies, so like policymakers. And if so, uh, how do you select them and for which purpose? So not necessarily to prevent the plastic, but you know, just to support your action or also to make a sort of integral complementary action from your side and from the other side. Yeah, no, so uh, we are a Dutch nonprofit, and we're very lucky that the Dutch government is uh, really supportive of our initiative. Um, so we do collaborate with the Dutch government, both in foreign affairs or in uh, our own internal affairs, or um, as they have really uh, committed to our goal that uh, we are working with them under a uh, covenant uh, for our offshore operations. Um, as you will understand, the, the high seas are, are owned by nobody and everybody's responsible for them and the Dutch government really wants to uh, take the lead in that. So they, they are actually uh, very proactive in supporting uh, the ocean cleaning operation that we're having. And uh, from that uh, perspective, we are uh, frequently contributing to uh, uh, the Dutch government. Uh, yeah, statements of cases, etc., in the IMO or in the UN or, or, or those types of organizations. Uh, so we do that. Um, uh, we do work with some uh, UN-related uh, organizations that help us operate in so many different uh, types of countries, so that's pretty good. Um, and um, yeah, other organizations uh, we want to collaborate with if they have an authentic and genuine wish to, to solve the same problem as we have, we will collaborate. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Annika. So we see Char uh, Charlotte, yes, had a question as well. Charlotte, are you there? Yeah, hi, yeah. Um, I was going to ask, how much better is biodegradable plastic to normal plastic? So I see a lot of like eco-friendly companies um, cafes and everything using biodegradable plastic bags um, and I know that it degrades faster but um, in terms of your work like how useful is that or is it just as bad really because it all ends up in the ocean right? Uh, no in fact biodegradable plastic uh, can replace a lot of the, the more uh, the, yeah, specific polymers that uh, otherwise will not degrade at all for centuries or, uh, or decades at least. Um, so, yeah, a biodegradable plastic is certainly a good alternative. The scale in which it is applied is actually quite small yet. So, uh, a lot of initiatives um, uh, yeah, are quite uh, yeah, on, on, on a scale of on, on the total amount of, uh, of non-biodegradable plastics that we consume, it's, it's almost negligible. Uh, and you also have to uh, keep in mind that some plastics actually, there's a difference between bio-based plastics and biodegradable plastics. So uh, that, that's important to know. Biodegradable actually can degrade in, in certain environmental conditions faster 
than non-biodegradable plastic, which takes forever. Um, but bio-based plastic can take just as long as non-bio-based plastic to degrade. So uh, even though it's made of other uh, um, based products, products, so not from oil, but from, from alternatives, fish, but the, the effect, in fact, could be the same. Um, so I think uh, what really needs to happen is plastic itself doesn't have to be the enemy as long as we have technology and infrastructure to continuously reuse those polymers, which we can actually, the technology is there, you can do it, but uh, the incentive is that it's cheaper to, to make new plastic than to collect used plastic, process it, and, 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 and remake new, uh, new products out of it. So um, people are willing to pay a little bit extra for uh, something more environmentally friendly. But there is a certain limit, so uh, yeah, the, the incentive at this stage is not there to recycle plastic in a large scale. Thank you. So there's a few more questions. Um, let's see, because we have um, normally a breakout session, but I would say uh, I see there's a lot of interest. So let's take the time for answering another few questions. Is that okay, guys? Is it okay? Yes, because it seems like uh, everyone wants to know a lot about this. Great. Okay. So then Valentin or Valentin, I don't know how to pronounce Yeah, it's Valentin actually. But Valentin. Never mind. Oh. <laughs> I was wondering how long does it take you to produce an interceptor? So from the time where you, where you get the order to the time where it starts to be put in service? Um, also a very good question. Um, the generation that we have now in the water is the, like a second generation and we are actually um, feeding all of the learnings of uh, those operations and the assembly times and all of the logistics involved into a third generation design. So we're still working on that as, uh, uh, as we speak, uh, but we hope to optimize the production process uh, so that uh, from order to uh, production, it should be yeah, six to nine months or so. Uh, and, and maybe faster at some stage, but for, for now that's what we can do. But we are working with a, a large manufacturer that can work on multiple locations uh, if we need to build multiple. Okay, Valentin, did I answer your question? Yes? Yes, thank you very much, yes. Okay, thank you. So we have another question from um, Jonas. Hi, um, so my question is, uh, you mentioned that you are implementing river interceptors in I think 1000 rivers within the next five years. And you said that currently you're financing these operations and also the implementation yourself, but or largely yourself. But would, would you see a trend within the interceptors that you've implemented that countries tend to finance these operations themselves in the long run when they see the benefits coming, uh, coming true? That's for sure what we hope. And of course, it depends on the specific uh, country and uh, the, the economy and the business opportunities that exist there. Uh, waste has a value. Um, it, it's still quite limited, um, but it does have a value. So continuously taking out waste out of a, a, a fixed stream, basically, uh, will give you some income. Um, so what we, what we see, what, what needs to happen is that the person who is operating these interceptors, which will not be us, because that would be massive, of course, operating hundreds and hundreds of those uh, projects around the world. Um, so the, the party who is uh, operating an individual interceptor needs to benefit from operating it. So there needs to be some income, uh, of course. So that can come either from waste or it can come from... Um, yeah, let's say governmental or other sort of fees to the, uh, like the street sweeper is paid for sweeping the streets. So like the fact that you are cleaning something that, that uh, you get some income for that as well. And what is another option, what we see is quite a lot of large organizations that uh, actually produce a lot of uh, packaging and plastic are taking more and more responsibility in also um, leveraging taking it out of the environment their plastic so they could uh, contribute in the financing part by paying for the plastic that is actually taken out of the environment and not at a uh, uh, normal going rate for for uh, used plastic which those prices are extremely low but for a slightly more premium 
uh, to actually leverage their CSR policies et cetera, to make sure that they are doing the right thing. So those are the three different streams of income that these operators should be able to collect uh, when operating in the sector. Very interesting. Thank you. Hey, thank you. So, uh, well, we have another one minute. So let's, uh, I skipped uh, Jessica's question before, but you will have a different angle to the question. So Jessica, if you're still there, you want to ask your question? Yes, thanks, Angela. Um, thanks so much for the, the talk. It's a really cool initiative that you have going on. Um, I was wondering about the technology development. Like, where did the initial ideas for um, the technology that you use in the ocean and in the rivers come from? And, and what kind of processes do you use to develop them? Yeah, very good question as well. Uh, the idea uh, generally comes from uh, Boyan himself. The idea for the ocean uh, technology was really simple. It was uh, a basic concept that he thought uh, to use the forces of the ocean that exist in the ocean to work for you to solve the problem rather than having to chase all the different bits of plastic by putting energy and effort uh, into it. He, he thought of a very, uh, yeah, an elegant idea uh, that because it's a gyre, so they're the, the zero, uh, the, the factor of the current is um, accumulated zero. So whatever is, is in there will stay in there. So if you place a, a barrier there that can work as a, a coastline, because coastlines are very effective in, uh, in collecting plastic. Uh, that's why those beaches are always so cool. So if you place an artificial coastline <coughs> in one of these uh, garbage patches, in one of these gyres, you will collect and concentrate the, the, the plastic, which makes it easier to take it out and transfer it to the shore. So that was the, the original idea. It went through a lot of different stages of, um, yeah, in, in basically a design evolution. It was first a one massive uh, barrier, and then it became a smaller uh, barrier that was uh, um, moving slower than the plastic because of uh, an anchor. And then we moved to an idea where it was faster than the plastic uh, because of the wind forces. And, and now we're back to moving slower again. So <laughs> there's a lot of different iterations in that uh, design development. Um, and, and the fact that we need iterations is because we, it is, as I started with, it's a really complex system of smaller and larger uh, forces that, that work both on the system and on the different plastic particles out there. Well, thank you so much for joining us, Lonica, today on a Saturday afternoon. Good luck with uh, all the challenges of this situation, but uh, amazing work, amazing idea, and super inspirational, I think, for everybody here in the community that um, wants to change the world, advance the world, to see that a big idea by one person can really affect the nations all around the world and completely how we live on this planet. So super, super inspiring. Thank you so much for your time and for the answers. Then hopefully we'll see your interceptors and I would love to see one actually. So I look forward to your thousand interceptors. So no matter where I go, I will see one somewhere in the river. That's what I would like to see. Uh, yeah, have a good Saturday and Sunday and stay safe from uh, Corona, right? Applause. Yeah, thank you. Good luck everyone.